Hello, good, mo good morning in California. It's a uh, good afternoon in Washington, D.C. Almost good. Yes, it is uh, good afternoon in Washington, D.C. My name is Rafael Fernandez de Castro. I'm the director of the Center for Jewish-Mexican Studies at the University of California, San Diego. And I welcome all of you to this webinar on the, result or on the results of the midterm election in Mexico. Uh, we have a great panel and uh, we're very happy about this. I'm very, uh, I'm delighted uh, to co-organize this with Andrew Rodman, uh, the director of the Mexico Institute at the Wilson Center. Welcome Andrew, I'm very happy to, to do this with you guys. And also with my dear friend, Jose Galicot, the head of Tijuana Innovadora. So uh, uh, we believe that uh, it's important that we get together to do this analysis on, on the Mexican election. It's, it's key for the future of Mexico. It is key for the future of just Mexican relations. And let me just remind you everybody that uh, we have a button there that say Q&A or preguntas y respuestas. Please send those your questions. We want to do this as interactive as possible. Uh, again, we have a uh, is wonderful panelists that I will that I appreciate uh, the effort to be with us. And let me give the floor to Andrew Rudman so he will introduce uh, formally our panelists. Go ahead, Andrew. Yours is the floor. Rafael, thank you and, and thank all of you for joining us today uh, to discuss the results of Mexico's June 6 midterm election. As, as Rafael noted, an incredibly important election. It, it was, as, as many, if not all of you know, the largest in Mexican history with over 21,000 positions to be filled. Uh, and, and those elections really were an institutional success that I, I think most of all demonstrates that democracy is alive and well in Mexico. As Rafael mentioned during today's conversation, we'll hear from a distinguished panel on the meaning of the results for Mexico and for the bilateral relationship with the United States. The elections occurred in the midst of a pandemic and witnessed one of the highest levels of campaign violence in Mexican history. And to successfully manage the electoral process in a transparent and reliable manner, accepted by virtually all candidates and parties, really is a testament to the National Electoral Institute, INE, and to Mexican democracy. The, the results offered something for almost everyone. The ruling Morena coalition retained its congressional majority, and Morena also won most of the governorships that were uh, selected last Sunday. In doing so, it exceeded its expectations at the gubernatorial level. But the opposition also had reasons to celebrate as the alliance between the PRI, the PAN, and the PRD increased its overall share in the Congress. I think those congressional results suggest that Mexican voters wanted divided government. They voted to deny Morena its two-thirds majority, which would have allowed it to amend the Constitution. And the gubernatorial results that I mentioned a moment ago maybe affirm this preference for divided government since an opposition candidate won 12 of the 15 races. Uh, and this suggests that Mexicans like alternating control to prevent any single party or coalition from amassing too much power. It may also suggest that Mexican voters don't know precisely what they do want, but they know that they didn't want more of what they had. The results raise a number of questions for today's discussion, including whether AMLO's approach will change as a result of new dynamics in the Congress and how the opposition will manage its greater ability uh, to influence Congress. Smaller parties such as the Partido Verde will also gain an influence and attention. What will they demand in return for their fealty to the Morena coalition? And then you have the Movimiento Ciudadano, which chose not to join either coalition and what kind of a role might it play looking forward to 2024? And finally, how will the results impact the US-Mexico bilateral relationship, if at all? So in sum, there's a lot to cover today. And joining us to help make sense of the results and what they pretend for the future, we have Kathleen Brun, Professor, Department of Political Science at UC Santa Barbara. We have Viri Viridiana Rios, a former Global Fellow of the Wilson Center, a columnist with El Pais, an instructor of US-Mexico politics at Harvard Summer School. Leo Suckerman, a commentator and broadcaster and a contributor with Oraculus. And my friend, Rafael Fernandez de Castro, uh, who will moderate today's program. We'd also like to thank our sponsors, the Center for US-Mexican Studies at UC San Diego School of Global Policy and Strategy, Oraculus, and especially to 
Jose Galico, the founder and president of Tijuana Innovadora. Uh, and uh, Pepe will now share some initial thoughts about the election and today's program. Thank you. Thank you. Really, it's very interesting to be today. The dos is setting and the election has been, have been done. It was a peaceful election. People went out to vote in large numbers. And uh, well, we'll talk about the whereabouts and the results of this election and also the future of Mexico. What's going to happen with this election? How the forces are going to work? What we think that is going to happen? And, and the reaction of the president of Mexico that has been very virulent against the, the people who, who wants to do the middle class. So I, 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 I want to hear what our friend Rafael is going to say. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Pepe. And it's wonderful to join forces with Tijuana Innovadora and the Mexico Institute. Uh, Leo Zuckerman, uh, could you give us a, a summary of, of, uh, of the results of the election and, uh, and, and tell us, uh, do you think that uh, polls of opinion uh, were right? Your mic. There. Well, uh, first, let me thank you for the invitation. I am very glad to be here with you again. Uh, and uh, well, uh, I think Andrew made a very good summary of the results. Uh, first of all, let, let me start with, at the federal level. If this was a soccer game, the winner would have been Morena because it scored more goals, no? It won more uh, representatives. It's going to be around 199. It's a plurality. It's a relative majority, a, a simple majority for Morena. But if you compare the results of Morena of what they had previously in the in this Congress, uh, they they lost uh, around 22 percent of the representatives, more than 50 representatives. Before the election, they have absolute majority, 50% uh, plus one, uh, just Morena. They didn't need uh, their other parties, their allied parties to approve the, the, the laws in Mexico. Uh, but more, most importantly, as you know, in Mexico, the federal budget is uh, only approved by the Chamber of Deputies. Uh, by the House of Representatives. So uh, Morena by itself had the power to approve the, the federal budget. That is, of course, the most important piece of legislation of every, of, every, of every year. So they lost positions and they, they are now a much, a, there, there is a lot of distance of, from the supermajority. Uh, they are far away from supermajority. Uh, in this Congress, they had the, the supermajority of two thirds with the support of PT, uh, Verde, PES, and some uh, independent uh, representatives. They lost that. Now they are far away from this supermajority. Uh, and because of this, uh, one of the possible winners of the election is the PRI, because as you know, from day one, President Lopez Obrador said that he's going to look for the support of the PRI if he wants to amend the constitution. No? So now the PRI, who used to be part of the mafia del poder, no? of the horrible, uh, terrible problems of the past, is going to be an accession probably an essential ally of the government. Now, what is also very sad of this federal election is that the big winner of this election is the Green Party. The Green Party is the worst party that has been produced by the Mexican democracy. It's not a party, it's a business. They have a business model, a very successful business model. And now Morena depends more on the Green Party to pass legislation and pass the budget 
That's why they, uh, before, even before the election was not over, the, one of the leaders of the Green Party started to say, we have to rethink about our alliance with Morena, meaning it's going to cost you a lot, no? uh, uh, our votes in Congress. No? Uh, so that's at the federal level. At the local level, it was also a very interesting election because Morena is undoubtedly the, 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 the winner, the overwhelming winner of the local elections at the, at, at the state level. They won um, 11 of the governorships uh, out of 15 that were, uh, that were for competition. Uh, and I would add up also the uh, governorship of San Luis Potosí that the Green Party won. Uh, because it's part of that uh, uh, government alliance. So the score was 12 to three, which is, as I told you, an overwhelming, uh, an overwhelming uh, win for uh, the president and, its, uh, and his parties. Uh, why? Uh, and I, I'm going to throw an hypothesis. I think that uh, we saw an incredible apparatus of electoral clientelism uh, which work perfectly at the state level. No, however, yep. however, yep. at the at the local level, it's also very important that uh, Morena lost all of the important cities of Mexico, and I'm talking about Mexico City, Guadalajara, Monterrey, and I'm talking about several uh, counties that are in the metropolitan areas of, of of Mexico City, Guadalajara, Monterrey. Puebla, eh, Hermosillo, eh, Veracruz. So if, if you see the electoral map, they 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 lost in the big in, in the biggest cities, which means which suggests that they lost the vote of the middle classes. That's why the president is very upset about the middle classes these days. So okay, Leo, yeah. let, let, let me uh, give the floor to Viri Rios and, and, and ask you, Viri, what is your take on the on the results of the election and what explains these results? Uh, we'll come back to you, Leo. Sure. Uh, thank you, Rafa, Andrew. Uh, such a pleasure to be here. I, I, I must say that uh, Viri was also a fellow here at the Center for US Mexican Studies. We keep on missing you, so you're welcome oh, anytime. Thank you. So good to be back um, on a Zoom. Um, I have a I have a different take from what uh, Leo is, is 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 telling us. So let me let me explain you um, my my point of view. I think that the main result of this election is actually very puzzling. Is the incapacity of the opposition to meaningfully cons confront um, Lopez Obrador. And to understand this, we need to uh, make sure we understand the context of this election and also how majorities are created in the Mexican Congress. So let me begin with the first one. Mexico is, a humani is, is facing a humanitarian crisis. Mexico has half a million excess deaths because of the pandemic. And the estimates show that uh, the country is going to have at least 10 million more people in poverty after the pandemic. Lopez Obrador also hasn't have any tangible or very meaningful um, result or advance in terms of fighting corruption and violence keeps being extremely persistent. So this midterm should have been a blown, a heavy, heavy blown, a swipe uh, to, to Morena, but it was not. And particularly, it was not, if we understand, this is my second point, how majorities are created in the Mexican Congress. Morena never won a qualified majority at the polls. And that's something that we need to understand. Morena, in 2018 election, won 308 seats. That's far away from the 334 seats that you need in order to construct a majority. Now, what happened? Well, what happened is that majority, the majority, the super majority of, of Morena was constructed later after the election. How they did that? Well, basically by, by cheating, well, or, or basically by making legislators from other parties 
to renounce to their party affiliation and join Morena, right? But that was not a winning that they had at the polls. That was not what the Mexican electorate wanted. And that's critical to understand, right? Now, the, con the conduct of Morena, this, this, this thing of renouncing to the party and joining Morena, now has been regulated. And that's great, right? Because under today's rule of the game, under today's rules of the game, Morena would have never won a supermajority, none in 2021 and none in 2018. So we need to make sure that we're comparing, you know, apples with apples, right? And when we compare apples with apples, Morena did pretty well. So let me let me tell you a little bit of the numbers when we compare what is comparable, meaning the results of the 2018 election before all the cheating in Congress and the results of 2021 election, right? So look at Morena's coalition. Morena's coalition lost 29 seats from 2021 to 2020, 20, from 2018 to 2021. That's way less than the average that we observe historically on a midterm in Mexico, where regularly an incumbent tends to lose 47 seats, right? So that's at least 30% less. Now, second, Morena individually as a party without coalition, it increased its seats. It's gonna go from nine from 190 to 197. So what does this mean? This is huge. No party in the history of Democratic Mexico had ever increased its seats on a midterm. Morena did it on the middle of a pandemic. Now, in terms of vote, Morena did reduce its vote, right? It went from having 35% in, in, sorry, 38% in 2018 to having now 35%, but that's losing three points, right? So again, uh, on a country that is in a humanitarian crisis at the local level, as Leo said, um, we they, they won, uh, they actually won more than the polls expected, particularly in Baja California. And critically, this is very important. This is, this is a critical data, the coalition, pan PRD pre lost in every single state where they run together, in every single one. They run in 10 in 10 of 15 states and they lost in every single one of them. Now Morena also, co also uh, controls 20 of 32 local congresses, which is something that is not regularly discussed on the international press, but it's critical because uh, you need local congresses in order to change the constitution in Mexico is one of the required steps for changing the constitutions. Um, so I, uh, I want to stop here, Rafa, just, just by saying that I, I think that the international press has kind of fall into a sort of self-indulgence, right? Comparing the results of Morena, not to reality, but to their fears, right? To what they thought Morena was gonna win, to the, to the powerful Morena that AMLO is constantly telling us about in the Mañaneras but the mañaneras are not reality and we cannot keep interpreting results in the way that AMLO wants us to interpret results. Thank you, Viri. This is very good. But in the end, I mean, you're telling us that Morena did fairly well. And uh, on, on that sense, I would say Leo Zuckerman has the same uh, uh, impression. Let me give the floor to Kate. Room. And Kate, uh, what are the implications of these results for political parties in Mexico? This is something that I know you care about. Uh, uh, Kate uh, wrote, I would say, the best book on the PR PRD, and uh, it was her doctoral dissertation um, uh, many years ago. And uh, but what is your take on the political parties? What does this say? say what what is the is, uh, uh, significance of the election for 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 the future of the political parties in Mexico? Okay. Well, I agree with almost everything that's been said so far. Um, I would caution, however, that the vote for Morena is not so much a vote for Morena as it is a vote in favor of AMLO. And so Morena as a political party is relatively weak internally. 
Uh, it had enormous difficulty selecting candidates this year uh, for the elections. There were multiple impugnaciones uh, to the federal courts. Uh, there were there were there was violence in some cases in some of the attempts to uh, to choose candidates, and there was a lot of accusations of fraud. So. I don't think that we should read from this vote that Morena as a party is solidly established at this point. When AMLO is, is uh, out of office, it's not clear that the party will be able to really carry forward without divisions. The second point that I would want to make is that I agree with Viri that the opposition is uh, not in quite as good shape as it might appear. On the positive side, more than half of the Mexican population voted against Junto Aremos, Historia, and Morena. There is a clear and strong desire for more options and for pluralism and for checks on the power of the president, which is a really a, a good sign for the future of Mexican democracy. On the other hand, this coalition is historically bizarre. And the unification of the three parties, the conservative PAN, the formerly leftist PRD, and the PRI itself in a national coalition um, bears witness to, I think, three problems for the political party system, one of which is polarization. This was an effort by the opposition parties to stop AMLO. So there's a, a pro and anti AMLO dimension emerging here that is, is really stark. And many of my friends in Mexico have talked to me about polarization. This might have something to do with why the polls were not as accurate as they have been in the past. The second problem is programmatic vacuousness. What does this PAN pre PRD coalition actually stand for? Apart from we have to stop AMLO and we have to consolidate our position as a democracy. Um, if the middle class abandons AMLO and Morena, what are they proposing instead? And I don't think that the opposition parties have really gotten their heads around what the alternative to the Cuarta Transformación really looks like programmatically. And the third problem is there is a real risk, I think, of brand dilution. Uh, a lot of research in, in political science suggests that this kind of convergence, the grand coalition, uh, is often a precursor or a symptom of party system collapse. And that would be very negative for Mexico if it were to occur. Uh, it's complicated because the party, parties also ran separately at the subnational level. But the rise of coalitions at the national and subnational level, and especially the rise of these ideologically incompatible coalitions, has contributed to ballot complexity, has contributed to the rising number of inadvertently spoiled ballots, and has perhaps contributed or reflects a dramatic decline in the number of Mexicans who express loyalty to any political party at all. In 2006, according to the Latin American Public Opinion Project, 49% of Mexicans declared they felt sympathetic to one or another political party. By 2018, it was less than 20%. Right? This is a very volatile situation then for future elections going forward in which the personalities of candidates are going to come uh, become more important. Thank you, Kate. Uh, Leo Viri, uh, you said so that uh, AMLO won the, 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 the election uh, uh, in, in, in some way. Uh, but the question to you both is, uh, does AMLO, uh, get stronger uh, with this election or the election weakens AMLO because now uh, with by not having super majority he cannot amend the constitution so uh, what is your take on this is AMLO uh, stronger now or, or is he or the election has weakened him Leo yeah uh, well let me start by answering some of uh, of, of Viridiana comments mm -hmm. uh, First of all, uh, she's right that Morena did well, uh, taking into account the very bad results of the government. But you have also to take into account the situation of the opposition in Mexico. No, The strength of a team in any game depends upon who has in front of the, who is going to play against with. No? And the opposition here in Mexico was, as I said, uh, in the ICU after the 2018 election, it was 
really a major, major defeat and they didn't know what to do. They decided to go in a coalition. Uh, it was a gamble. I think the gamble paid off. And uh, even in this weakness, they uh, managed to stop, I think, uh, Morena because uh, and Miridiana is again, uh, again right to say that they constructed the majority after the elections. Well, the, the difference is that now even with cheating, what they did the last time, even with, if they try to cheat, and they are going to cheat again, of course, they are not going to have the super majority. No? That's why they will need the PRI to, to get a super majority. That's the big difference. No? Uh, they, they didn't need the PRI uh, in, uh, in the last Congress. No? But uh, now let me go to your question, uh, uh, to your question, Rafael. I think the president uh, is left uh, in a weak situation, uh, in a weak situation because he's not going to have the supermajority. And besides, uh, because of the electorate, because of the results, uh, the two of uh, one, well, the most important possible candidate for him to succeed him, who is Claudia Sheinbaum, the mayor of Mexico City, uh, is, uh, is in a weak position. Why? Because uh, Claudia Sheinbaum lost in the, in, in the, Mexico, the, the Mexico City election. And this is a major result because for the first time since 1997, the left lost Mexico City. And that's not good news for Sheinbaum. And Lopez Obrador knows this. And he knows that, and, and as you know, in the Mexican presidential system, the second half of the sexenio is to prepare for the presidential succession. So and I think what happened is that uh, because of the electoral results, the president uh, is in a, uh, in a weaker situation than before the, the, the election. Thank you, Leo. What is your take, Viri? Uh, do you see as well that uh, AMLO is uh, weaker now that, uh, in, in regards to the, the, the coming uh, 2024 election? Yeah, I mean, definitely, because that's what happens regularly on midterm elections. Uh, that's why I think we need to, you know, uh, the analysis needs to be on historical terms, because in historical terms, every single president has always become, the incumbent has always become uh, weaker during the midterm elections. Now, something interesting, which um, Leo is already pointing to, is, is where the weakness is happening. Right, because it is not homogeneous. It's not happening in in the whole Mexican society, and we we see at least three very interesting trends. Right, the first one is that college educated people are punishing Morena. Right, we we see a difference of at least fifteen points, one five points, uh, when you look at the vote uh, two thousand eighteen versus two thousand twenty one. Uh, the second one is, uh, and this is this is quite interesting, is people that lost their job during the pandemic. Uh, in that area, we see a diminish of six points of support towards Morena. And finally, uh, and and this is uh, this is interesting, we see an, an increase of support on people that is benefiting from social programs. Now, a lot of people are saying that this is a, a reaction to like regular pre-type of clientelism, I would I would qualify that. I think that social programs are, are public policies, right? And it, it's okay that people vote in favor of social programs the same way that it would be okay to vote in favor of any other uh, public policy. Uh, furthermore, social programs are conditioned, right? Social programs in Mexico are conditioned to attendance to college, sorry, to attendance to high school, uh, to uh, be a, a farmer, uh, to uh, do some forms of uh, reforestation to, you know, of course, uh, there are problems with the implementation of these uh, social programs, right? And we have discussed this so many times, right? Uh, but, but the very fact that people are voting uh, in favor of social programs, I don't think we can we can say that that's necessarily the same as just like the simple you know vote buying that we observed with the pre in the in the 70s 80s and 90s and early 90s. 
Thank you, Vidi. Uh, uh, may just a, add one little point sure. here, though. Of course, of course. Um, that uh, I agree with the national government analysis and the, the next three years in legislative terms, but I don't think we should forget that they picked up a large number of governorships. And governorships have historically been really important in mobilizing votes for the next presidential election. So in that sense, I think that, that AMLO and Morena have actually improved their prospects for the next election, but it will mean a different kind of campaigning. It will mean a campaigning that's, that draws upon a sort of a pre-style mobilization of state resources uh, to get the vote out at the, at the state and local levels. Thank you, Kate. There's a, a, a in the Q and A. There's a there's a at least three questions about violence uh, within uh, within the election and about the the role of organized crime. Our good friend Rod Camp is asking us. Could you give us a sense, Kate, of, of I mean, how uh, I mean what was the role of organized crime and why uh, there's so much violence against politicians? I think that uh, there, there, has, there were, I think, 35 candidates who were assassinated this year. Um, it is not entirely clear who is responsible, whether it was organized crime directly or whether it was rivals of the parties themselves uh, trying to get control of local governments. They were mostly mayoral candidates. Uh, so are they trying to get control of local governments so that they can cooperate with the drug cartels? Is, you know, to what extent is this something that the drug cartels actually want, uh, this level of violence, or is it something that is kind of an unintended byproduct of the struggle over plazas in Mexico? Thank you. What is your take on this, Leo? Well, uh... It's a terrible situation. I have spoken with many people in Sinaloa. Sinaloa, as you know, uh, is the house of the cartel of Sinaloa, of El Chapo Guzman and El Mayo Zambada. And it was won by Morena this time, the governorship. And people tell me that, you know, in Sinaloa, the government always has to have the support, you know, quote unquote, of the organized crime. Uh, but what they tell me is that this time it was uh, a, a much uh, open and clear uh, intervention of the organized crime in the election, no? Uh, and uh, the question is why? And uh, I think uh, we have a terrible problem in Mexico, a horrible problem where organized crime has understood that they need not only the support of the government, but the control of the government, no? What happened in San Luis Potosí, it's, it's very clear. It's not that the new governor is going to have an alliance or a link with organized crime, but it is the organized crime. He's the mafia, he's the head of the mafia. Ricardo El Pollo Gallardo is the chief, is the boss of the San Luis Potosí mafia. So the difference now is not between having links or alliance of organized crime with the government, but to control the government. And this is especially important at the major, at, at the mayor's level, at the, uh, at the city level. Why? Because uh, they need the control of the, of, of, of the local government, of the county government, not only to have the control of the police, but they also need it for other businesses that they are now expanding, no? For example, extortion and kidnapping. No, so and even they are also using the public uh, construction uh, of, of of the majors of the uh, of the counties to launder the money. So uh, it's becoming an incredible business for organized crime to control the government, not only to have. A, a kind of negotiation and alliance with the government. Now they want to control the government. Thank you, Leo. That's a very strong uh, uh, elaboration and explanation. I will ask Vidi for her take on that, but uh, let's also speculate a little bit about the future. I mean, this is, I mean, we're entering into 2024. So uh, who wins uh, with this midterm election? Uh, Marcelo Ebrard or Ricardo Morreal? And, uh, 
is uh, the possibility of AMLO uh, uh, changing the constitution to run again just out? Uh, would you rule out that completely? And what about the opposition? So, Billy, tell us something about organized crime and then uh, help us speculate about the future, the coming future, <laughs> which is who's going to be the next president. Oh, no, I'm <laughs> terrible at doing that. So uh, I'll do my best. Uh, about violence, I actually think Leo capture perfectly what is happening in Mexico, so nothing to add on there. Um, but, but let's talk about the future. And I'd like to focus on what happened in Mexico City because uh, Mexico City has long been kind of like the future of, 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 of Morena, right? Like in, in, in the 90s, it was the first um, state, but back then it was not, not a state, but like it was the first important metropolitan area that went to the left. It has been ruled by Morena or PRD for about two decades, a little bit more than that. Um, and now we are seeing a fracture uh, within Mexico City in which it seems that um, the west of the city, or to be more accurate, the areas where the middle class lives in Mexico City have basically said no to Morena and voted for the coalition pre-pan PRD. Um, and and the, the other side of the city, right, those areas that are more poor and that uh, have uh, less access to to public services are remaining loyal to Morena's, Morena's coalition, right? And, and I think there is th this is very revealing of uh, the potential future of Morena and also the potential change in the landscape of Mexican politics, right? Because uh, Mexico had, uh, had uh, be like some form of ideological vote, but never a class divided cleavage. And if Mexico starts moving into a cleavage that is about uh, basically income levels and education levels, that's going to be a little bit different from what we had seen before. Uh, and that's going to probably create way more polarization. So I, I, I think that in the future, maybe we will observe a more polarized um, uh, country. I am not sure that any of the mayor candidates that we thought were going to win 2024 are going to win uh, the scandal of Mexico's subway collapse uh, is hitting deeply into Morena's presidential uh, personalities, both Claudia, because she's the mayor of Mexico City, and Ebrar, because he constructed uh, the subway when he was mayor of Mexico City, right? So I, I probably see uh, other factions of Morena position themselves in the future to probably uh, run uh, under, under Morena's label. Thank you, Billy. Uh, Andrew and Pepe, if you want to, to ask a question, uh, uh, Kate, I, I would like uh, to uh, ask you directly, do you rule out the possibility of AMLO changing the constitution uh, to try to re-elect himself? No, I don't. Um, but I think the odds have gone down, uh, that, the, that the result of this election has reduced the odds that he will successfully pull that off. Um, I think that if he were to do something like that, he would probably try to do it through a referendum rather than through the Congress. Um, and then that use that to put pressure on the Congress uh, to approve it. But let's not forget too that AMLO is not uh, a young man. Um, and he's already had at least one heart attack that we know of. Uh, so it may well be that this is not, this is going to be a moot point, whether re-election in Mexico uh, will become a reality. Um, I have lowered the bar on my personal standards of what is completely impossible after Trump's election in the United States <laughs> and January 6th. So maybe, maybe the, the, I wouldn't say the odds are high that this would happen in Mexico, but I can't rule it out completely. Thank you, Kate. Uh, uh, Andrew Rudman. Thank, thanks, Rafael, and, and, and thank all of you. Um, picking up on a, a couple of the, the themes, and we're trying to connect some of the themes that have come up. One of the questions I think before the election was whether there would be any particular visible woman's vote, um, given some of the violence against women in Mexico, the increase in femicides, the, the march on March 8th. But at my understanding, and Leo, you can maybe speak to, to this particular aspect of it, my 
impression is that there, there's no, actually no indication that women voted differently than men uh, across the board. The percentages are pretty similar, but I wonder if any of you have any thoughts on why there was or was not a, a quote unquote women's vote in this election and what that might mean for the future for Morena in particular. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Leo, don't uh, call yourself short up about your speculation. Who do you think is going to be the next <laughs> Mexican president? <laughs> Oh, uh, well, it depends on the survival of the opposition coalition, no? Uh, you like be you like bets, uh, Leo. So who, I know. who are you betting for? <laughs> I think Lopez Obrador is going to pull off the next election, and he's going, and Morena is going to win the next election. Who is going to be the candidate? It's uh, still for grabs. But I would say that uh, even that Claudia Sheinbaum lost the Mexico City, she's going to be the candidate uh, of Morena uh, and with good odds for winning the election if the opposition coalition divides. Because at this point, Rafa, uh, uh, López Obrador has all the incentives to, to divide and conquer. No, to divide the, the, this opposition coalition. And uh, so uh, we will have a candidate from PAN, from PRI, from PRD, from, I mean, the more candidates you have on the ballots, the, the, the greatest the odds for Morena to win that election, no? But if I had to, to, to bet today, and you are putting a gun on my, on my head, <laughs> that, uh, I would say so. But of course, this is going to change a lot. Uh, but at this point, I would say that, 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 that Morena has the advantage in the presidential election. Yeah, at least in the, in the next two years, the Mexican economy is doing much better because of, of, the, of the enormous growth of the Mexican economy. Now, uh, let me tell you something that I didn't like from Claudia Sheinbaum, and I actually wrote about this in my column. I didn't like that uh, she she didn't she didn't show uh, a, a leadership with uh, what happened in Mexico City. She uh, went behind Lopez Obrador to def defend herself, uh, and I think that was a huge mistake because she had the opportunity to increase her uh, her leadership within the party within the Mexican society. And what happened is that she showed that uh, she is the candidate and she is the, let me say, the niña de los ojos de, de López Obrador, no? That she is behind López Obrador. She's not stepping ahead of López Obrador, no? Well, she's playing with the old rules of the PRI. I mean, she's expecting AMLO to appoint her as Morena candidate. And that bit, could happen, that, that could work for Morena supporters, but I'm not sure that, that is going to bring more votes for, for her outside Morena, no? I want to say something a little yeah. bit about Andrew's question too, though. Uh, I, I think it's premature to say that the reaction to the feminist uh, marches has had no effect. The percentages overall may look the same, but the marches were never about the majority of Mexican women. They were about educated, young, at uh, Mexican women, the, the, the self-defined feminists. And I think that what Viri was talking about, about the this decline among really educated people is masking some of this effect. That what we're seeing is in fact that, that young educated women are, are really not happy with what's been going on under Lopez Obrador. And we need to take apart some of the, the polling and really look more closely at what was going on to be able to see whether that effect is, is in existence. Thank you, Kate. Uh, Billy, what is your take on um, how these uh, results of, of this election is affecting US-Mexican relations? And let me ask you uh, as well, I mean, you, you, you're telling us that uh, the opposition, they didn't know what to do. They don't really have a narrative. They, they only go against AMLO. What would be, I mean, if you were the advisor to, 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 to the PRIAN, what would be your <laughs> advice to them? <laughs> um, 
Okay, well, I, I would say three things, right? So the first one is about what Kate mentioned, that's, that's correct. Actually, when you look at the specific uh, section of women, urban, young, educated, that specific uh, type of electorate did punish Lopez Obrador uh, very hard, right? So, so Kate is, is right on that. Second thing about violence, which is I was reading on the comments and I thought about saying this, which is, yes, 2021 has been by far the most violent election against candidates, but we need to also uh, you know, add the context to this, which is that this is historically the largest election ever held in Mexico, right? There were 21,000 positions uh, that, that were being elected, right? So once you consider that kind of like the denominator of, of, the, of, of, of violence, right? Uh, then you notice that actually this election was less violent than 2018, right? Because 2018 was a way smaller election. Uh, so, I, and then third about uh, my, my position as advisor to the PRIAN, um, <laughs> I don't think they would hire me, but if they were, I would say that they need not only a narrative about what to do, but um, narrative about how change is going to happen. Because the narrative of Lopez Obrador is powerful because he has provided a clear answer as to why Mexico hasn't reduced poverty enough and hasn't increased the middle class. And his narrative is, is, is the following. It's very simple. It's, there is a mafia del poder. There are corrupt elites that have taken over and contaminated politics and the economy in favor of their own interest and in detriment of the people, right? And that's a very powerful, uh, you know, kind of like um, um, uh, argument, right? That's that's like a, that's a that's a very powerful argument, particularly in a country like Mexico, where indeed we do have a lot of a lot of inequality. The PRIAN, right, the pre-PAN PRD, needs to tell us what are they going to change? What's the reason they have been in power for a century, right, first 70 years with the PRI, then 12 years with the PAN, and they couldn't change the situation in sufficiently meaningful ways. So they need to create a narrative about change. How is that change going to happen? And how are they going to change? Right, because when you look at the at the people that won, for example, in the Congress with Pan and with PRD, it's basically the same last names that were on the polls three years ago, ten years ago, and fifteen years ago. Right, so so there is not really like a renewal of the political class in the opposition in in Mexico, neither within Morena, right? But but the opposition needs it more. I'm going to suggest my friends at the PRIAN to, to, to hire you. <laughs> I, like, I like your question, I like your answer a lot. Let me, uh, Kate, uh, Leo, and, uh, and, and all of you, we all were very worried about Mexican democracy before this election. Now, I believe we, we can say that the Mexican democracy is there, that we have a very sophisticated uh, organization for the election, a citizen uh, uh, organized election, which is wonderful, and INE did very well. So this means that, uh, I mean, we shouldn't worry about Mexican democracy. We shouldn't worry about AMLO's attacks on some of the uh, independent institutions. Well, Rafa, I have to tell you, I am extremely happy about the results of this election. Extremely happy. Uh, not only because Cruz Azul won the soccer championship this year, <laughs> years, but because of the election. Uh, what we have, what we saw is, as Andrew said, uh, a democratic normality uh, in this country. We are far away from things that have been uh, said during the campaigns that Mexico was uh, going to be a dictatorship, or even that we are going, we are going to have a, a hegemonic uh, party, just like we had during the PRIs in the 70s or that. We are far away from that. The entire 20th century. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Almost the entire 20th century. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And I have to tell you, I, uh, I think everybody wants something. So everybody lost something. That's democratic normality, no? 
And if you see the debates that we're having right now in Mexico, they are in essence, very democratic. Who is going to ally with whom, what's going to happen with Congress, what's going to happen with the Supreme Court. The discussion is about the institutions, not about a one man, one, man, one party system. So I think at this point, uh, I am extremely satisfied with the results. I think the INE, as Just Andrew said, is also a winner of this election. I don't see how the INE would disappear. As Lopez Obrador said, he would propose to disappear the National uh, uh, Electoral Institute. That is off the table. I think he's not going to have the, the, the votes to do that. So I think. Uh, as, 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 as a conclusion, I would say that after 25 years of democracy in Mexico, there is some kind of roots, that, of democratic roots taking over in the country. Uh, very superficial, shallow at this, at, at this moment, but uh, they are still there. Society showed in, in that in Mexico, we want democracy, Rafa. Thank you, Leo. I, I, I love your answer, but I, I'm a bit more skeptical. And let me ask you, Kate, uh, would you agree with, with Leo? And uh, let me ask you, Andrew and, and Jose Galicot, to jump in and ask a question because we have an eight minutes to go. So why don't you ask another question, uh, uh, make a comment, and we'll give the floor to each one of our three wonderful panelists uh, to make a final comment. OK, what, what, I find, what I found in this analysis is Questions, 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 questions. The future looks very blurry in many ways, but interesting. The, the narcos, I fear the narcos and I fear their, their control of the country. I, I uh, think I see the figure of Lopez Obrador growing, being more impressive as a president, even that he has a contrast with the middle class. And I, I think he made a mistake because the middle class thinks and votes and are active. And uh, Piri, your analysis is brilliant. Thank you for giving us. And I agree, you should go directly to the plan immediately. <laughs> they will, they should hire you. Uh, Kate, thank you for your fantastic remarks. And and Leo, I don't like the the, the Cruz Azul, so I, I so I'm don't agree with you. But fantastic uh, the explanation. But we need more of these because. There are more questions than answers. We we came out and suddenly we have big problems to, uh, to confront. But the economy, and remember the, the, what I say the first time, is it, it, the, the stupid, is the, the economy, is the economy stupid. So we have to see that the economy is good. So that will protect in certain way the Morena project. Uh, this is what I think. Thank you. Pepe. Andrew, if it's fine with you, why don't I give the floor to Kate, uh, Leo, and, and, and Piri, and then you close. Okay? Perfect. Unless you want to ask them a question, Andrew. Uh, no, I, I think, frankly, that, that's the challenge. There are so many topics already on the table. Why don't, why don't they go ahead and, and clean up what's there? <laughs> Kate. Well, I'm worried about U.S. democracy, so I'm, of course I'm worried about Mexican democracy. Um, but I think, overall, these elections were a positive sign for Mexican democracy. Nobody boycotted the election. There were no major incidents of violence on election day. There was no major evidence of fraud. The INE worked despite the pandemic, despite everything that was going on and despite even the violence that happened. And nobody's really challenging the results of the election. So, I, I mean, I think in all of these respects, there's there's, evidence that both at the elite and the mass level, people want democracy in Mexico to continue. Um, and, and that really is a good sign. I'm not always sure I can say that about the US. Um, uh, Kate, could you so, explain your, your worrisome about the US just in, in a very short way? My, my worries about the US? It's about the Republican 74 Party. 74 million people voted for Donald Trump and still think the election was stolen. I mean, I think that's not good. And we have a Congress, a Senate, that's not willing to cooperate on whether people should drive on the right-hand side of the road. Uh, so that's a bad sign as well. I mean, it, I think that ironically, 
AMLO is going to have an easier time buying himself a coalition in Congress than Biden will. Uh, so there, there are some reasons to think that um, that U.S. democracy is not in the best of health. Um, I Thank think, no, um, I and I, I, I do think that there are signs. I think Jose Galicot is right that one of the problems for Mexican democracy will be the drug cartels and their influence over politics and their increasing desire to play a direct role. I think that's a that's a real worry, um, and I also agree that. Um, if there is no progress uh, economically or in addressing the issues of poverty that have come out of the pandemic, that if Morena is also losing its cachet as a solution, then what is change? Prian is not change. Uh, Lopez Obrador is not change. Morena is not change. You know, where do voters turn for a real sense of identification and uh, hope in the political system. But I think that, you know, as, as just looking at this election, it, it was a good day for Mexico. Thank you, Kate. Leo. Well, I am also worried about democracy in all the world. Of course, there is this uh, populist uh, wave that is threatening the uh, democracies all around the world. But I am more optimistic about the Mexican, the Mexican democracy after the election. And let me tell you also why uh, another point, which is Mexico is part of two neighborhoods, uh, North America and Latin America. And if we compare ourselves with Latin America, with the neighborhood that we are part of the South, we look pretty well, extremely well, I would say, no? Let's compare Mexico, I don't know, with Colombia, no? What's happening in Colombia? with the violence in Colombia or what's happening with the election in Peru or how is how they are going to write a new constitution in Chile or what's going to happen in the next election in Brazil or the persistence of the Peronistas in Argentina or Bukele in El Salvador or Ortega in Nicaragua or of course Venezuela or Cuba I mean, we have to, I mean, I know that Mexicans, we tend to, to, to be very critical of, of our country, but if we see our country in comparison of what's happening in the neighborhood, and we have to hear what's happening in the neighborhood, because something very big is happening in Latin America. But if we compare ourselves with Latin America, sorry, but I have to tell you, I take Mexico any, any day of the week. Thank you, Leo. And I, I just disagree because I believe you still be too optimistic about the U.S. <laughs> Here, the reality is very harsh. Uh, as I, I, I hate Trump, I have to tell you, and I, I know that, 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 that it's a major threat. But I mean, I am also optimistic that Biden won. In the end, who is the president today? Biden. OK. Thank you, Leo. Uh, this is wonderful. Bidi, you have the, the last word of the panels, and, and then we'll go to Andrew. I'm not worried about Mexico democracy. And, and I think we need to observe what happened in order to become more positive about it. Um, AMLO, for example, accepted his defeat in Mexico City the next day that the electoral results came out. And he said he complained, right? He said that it was because of propaganda. He said that there was a lack of consciousness on the class consciousness on the middle class. You know, like he, he complained, but he accepted, right? So like, you know, that's not the AMLO that we regularly read about on the international press because the AMLO we read about is kind of like these like Venezuela dictator, you know, kind of like moving co the country towards communism. And that's really not what is happening in Mexico. We need to have a, a better a better analysis to, to understand what is really going on. Now I'm gonna close uh, with the two topics that I think we should discuss the next time, Rafa. The first one is the big winner of US-Mexico politics, which is the labor law, labor law enforcement in Mexico and uh, within the USMCA by, with, with, with AMLO. And the second one is the big loser, which I think is, is energy policy, particularly green <laughs> energy policy. And, and, and that's, that's, I think those are the two main topics for the two countries. Oh.
I, I was going to take your word, and, and I will ask Andrew and Jose Galicot to do a next webinar on those topics. It's, 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 it's wonderful. Uh, you, you're right. Andrew, we go to you, and, and thank you guys for your wonderful participation from the bottom of my heart. Thanks a lot. Andrew, you, you have the last words. Thank you, and, and thanks, everybody. Really a, a, a fantastic conversation, as, as Barry was alluding to, so many more topics that we could, that we could cover. Um, and, and I'll just quickly say, I, I think the, the point, the, the main point, I, it's where I started and many of you picked up, is that democracy worked in Mexico, and, the, and that is, at the end of the day, really important, as was alluded to. There were some real concerns about how people would accept the results, the legitimacy of the institutions, et cetera. So I, I think that's incredibly important. Another um, point that came out today, I think it really is important when it comes to opposition is uh, you have to run with something or represent, tell the story of for something. It's hard to constantly win by just running against uh, the other side. And, and, and I will say, personally, I find that more and more is the case that you're always voting against something and not for something. And I think the secret, as Barry alluded to, for the opposition is to figure out what is that for? What, what can you get people excited about? Um, and, and the other thing we didn't talk about that maybe answers could answer the question of the third way is the, the Movimiento Ciudadano, which is winning at the state level in economically important states and chose not to belong to either coalition. And what that means going forward, whether it's an answer, whether it means a, a, you know disruption of coalitions, that too is something I think we'll wanna look at more in the future. But thank you all again, fantastic panel. Thank you all for so many participants and so many questions that I know we wish we could have gotten to. Thank you all, and thank you to, to, to everybody who participated. We had a lot of people today. We have a lot of questions. Thank you all. Thank you, Viri. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Leo, uh, on behalf of Jose and, and Andrew. And uh, uh, I believe, yes, the Mexican democracy is up and walking. I wouldn't say running, but it's walking, and it's walking uh, 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 very healthy. Un abrazo. Thanks a lot. <laughs>